This is a CT reconstruction of a man who got in a fight at a bar and had his head bashed in with a glass bottle. So what do we do about this? This 23-year-old man arrived to our emergency department after being brought there by EMS. He did experience a brief loss of consciousness after he was struck, but by the time he came to the emergency department, he had no complaints other than the gash on his head and a little bit of a headache and some decreased self-esteem. He had this CT scan done in the ER where you see this depression of his skull where he was struck in the head. And then following this is a CT of his brain where you can see a small amount of subdural hematoma up underneath that skull fracture right there between his skull and his brain. March is Brain Injury Awareness Month, and lucky for you, we're gonna be talking about brain injuries all month long. First, classify any skull fracture as open versus closed. In simple terms, open means does it communicate with the outside world, like with a cut? Yes, his dead, so he has an open, depressed skull fracture. Now, when we talk about skull fractures, there are many different types. A is showing a diastatic fracture, which is actually a fracture along your suture line or along the natural planes where your skull closes when you're a baby. B is showing a depressed skull fracture, like in our patient, where a part of the skull is actually smashed down into the brain. C is the most common after any type of head injury, which is basically a, just a crack in the skull. D is representing a basilar skull fracture, which is a skull fracture along the base of the skull, a different entity. And in today's video, I'm gonna only be talking about depressed skull fractures, which is where the skull is actually pushed into the brain. Those other three types of skull fractures, those are almost unanimously treated conservatively, meaning we don't really repair them. Now the preferred imaging method of any type of suspected skull fracture is a CAT scan of the brain without contrast. A CAT scan allows us to look at the head by two different views. The traditional view will allow us to look at the inner contents of the brain, and then the bone windows will allow us to specifically evaluate the skull, and that's the best way to evaluate a suspected skull fracture. Now, on this particular image on the bone windows, you can see this compound skull fracture here, and on the brain windowing, you can see that there is some bruising or some hemorrhage underneath that fracture in the brain itself, indicating trauma to the brain. And in this picture, you can see a frontal skull fracture or right here on the front part of the brain. And you can see that it's continuous through the frontal sinus, which is a part of our paranasal sinuses or the mucosa field sinuses that drain out our nose and communicates with the outside world. This is really important to us as surgeons because a fracture through the frontal sinus may be treated markedly different depending on if it extends through the front and back wall of the sinus. All of the images and knowledge that I'm sharing with you on today's case, I have got from a resource with a wealth of knowledge on neurosurgery called Neurosurgery Atlas. It's the most reliable and popular platform for neurosurgical techniques. You're getting the insider information today. So how do we know if this patient needs surgery? One of the main indications for surgery, whether or not they have a skull fracture, is if they have a compressive and symptomatic hemorrhage. This patient has a very small subdural hematoma or a blood clot between the skull and the brain itself. This particular bleed is small and would be non-operative if it only existed in isolation, but it is associated with this depressed skull fracture. Skull fractures that are depressed greater than the thickness of the cranium, we often take to the operating room because we are concerned of an underlying injury to the dura or the covering of the brain. You can think about that logically. If the dura is open, which is covering the brain, and the skin is open, the outside world is in communication with the brain, and we need to wash that out. Other operative indications for surgery is injury to the back wall of a frontal sinus fracture, an obvious cosmetic deformity like in our patient, because you can imagine if this heals, you will be able to see this on his forehead. And that's not a good look for him, so we need to fix it. Pneumocephalus or air underneath the skull is also an indication for surgery because that means air from the outside world has gotten inside of the cranium. And this should probably go without saying, but any gross contamination of a wound should also go to the operating room so we can wash it out. Well, when should they go? What is there to wait on? We go to the operating room as soon as possible because the brain is exposed to the outside world and we need to get that cleaned up 
ASAP. That usually means within 12 hours, so the sooner the better. And not all these wounds are easy, and sometimes we do use the assistance of plastic surgery to help us close these wounds. First of all, we will open the skin overlying the fracture and often incorporate the laceration into that incision. We will also clean up any soft tissue that's been damaged as we come in, like cleaning up the skin and the wound itself. When we get down to the skull fracture, we will remove and often have to drill off components of the skull that have been damaged by the fracture. We will then inspect the dura or the covering of the brain and even evacuate any clot in the epidural or subdural space. Like you see here, this is an example of an epidural hematoma between the skull and the dura. After we've removed the fragmented skull, evacuated the clot on the brain, we will then sew up the covering of the brain, called the dura, in a watertight fashion so no spinal fluid can leak out. And once that's done, we will then plate the skull back. And often, if any of those fragments of bone have been contaminated, we'll even use a steel or metal plate to cover that hole in the skull. Then we close the wound. Now there are a few exceptions here. Our brain has many large draining veins called the venous sinuses. These sinuses are located right up underneath the skull. So if the fracture is involving a portion of bone overlying a sinus, you may manage them totally differently. Repairing a hole in a venous sinus is a whole nother ball game. And let me tell you, speaking from experience, it's not very fun. Fractures of the frontal sinuses are also managed markedly different than your traditional skull fracture. You often have to do what's called a bifrontal craniotomy where the incision goes from one ear all the way across to the other ear. We fold down that skin and then harvest the pericranium, which is the covering of the skull, to pack down into the sinus. This is protecting the brain from the outside world. That is obviously a more complicated operation than just a simple fracture repair. 10 out of 10, don't recommend that one either. An empiric treatment with medications to prevent early post-traumatic epilepsy, as well as antibiotics for prevention of infection, really depend on the extent of the injury. Our patient went to the operating room within just a few hours, had the skull fracture repaired and the hematoma evacuated. He went home the next day and other than having a scar on his forehead, He's done very well since the operation. At least he has a story to tell. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and we'll go through another case.